Hmm. And Andrew, you're such a brand noser with that sign in the back. <sighs> you're just jealous. You didn't think about it, CB. This is true. <laughs> okay, lower your camera a little bit. Oh. Hey, Hassan. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us from Montreal. Welcome. So I should open my chat. Yeah, so everybody should let us know uh, where they're, oh. where, uh... hey Marina, I'm from Brazil. I'm, I'm in Brazil too. Where in Brazil are you? I'm in Brazil, yeah. Nice. What time is it in Brazil right now? Is it the same MTD? 11.46. Oh, okay. Brett, we're, the questions that you uh, send us from the audience will be in the chat. Or there's a there's a function of, of Q and A. Um, I think we both we all all to monitor both channels. Some people may put their questions in Q and A. Um, we went through that yesterday, so okay. um, I think if we all monitor Q and A and then the chat, then we should be um, hmm. all good. So Dave Lamb, Peter Frowley. Tarek, we have 10 attendees so far. Hello, everybody. So we're, we have a panelist in Brazil. We have one in England, one in France, and one in Colorado. Yeah. Hi, William. Hi, Tarek. Hi, Tarek. Oh, that's nice, from Egypt. And... Egypt is in the house. Yes. Yeah, cool. Wow. You're most welcome, Tarek. Tarek, do you know Valentina Primo in, uh, in Egypt? The Netherlands. Let's Los Angeles. Let's not forget LA. 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 Thanks, Tarek. Yeah, she's a, uh, she works with a company called, uh, an organization uh, called, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, startup, uh, startup, uh, startup without, Startups Without Borders. Uh, and in, she started it in Egypt. Uh, I don't know if that makes it easier to remember who that might be, but uh, very active in the startup scene in Egypt. Okay, cool. Better rise up, yeah. Blonde, I think uh, she's Argentinian or something. It's a great name. Start uh, startups without borders. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a cool organization. They um they're doing some pretty good work around um, you know helping. Uh, Immigrant entrepreneurs in in Europe and and the Middle East, um, in in Northern Africa. Uh, Andrew, you have to be closer to the camera, otherwise you get invisible. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, this is fine. Is no, okay? otherwise, it's magic. Thank you, Mitali. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, we've had a blast getting this ready, so I hope uh, everybody appreciates it. We're going to have a great time. Uh, she's working all over Northern Africa. I think some in Morocco, some in Egypt. I know she's in Italy 
right, she's based out of Italy right now. She was based in, in Egypt for a couple of years. Um, but you can you can find out more from, from her Facebook. Uh, And I think that was Hassan that, that answered uh, that asked that question. Her name is uh, Valentina Prima, but it's it's startup without borders. Startups without borders. Great name. And I'm guessing you're in Morocco, Hassan. But Morocco is one of my favorite places. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Ter Derek, for putting it in. Sorry. Here. Tell her that Tarek and Rhett Center sent you, Hassan. I just turned down a job in Morocco to be the Peace Corps director um, there. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't the right time, but yeah, Morocco is a special place. That's very interesting, Red. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not going to talk politics, but I couldn't work for this administration. <laughs> Mm, when were you last there? Uh, November of last year. Oh, November of last year. Okay. Hello, Robert. Hey, Robert. Robert. Where in the Netherlands are you from? Right. Did you, Robert? Did you see? Uh, did you see Marshall? Uh, I think it was a year ago in Amsterdam. Did you go and see him with uh, Barack Obama and some other great guys? We can't hear you, Robert, but we can read you. We can't hear you. CB, are you on? No, CB is on mute. Okay. On mute. I'm listening to all. I put myself on mute in case my little four legged son starts uh, contributing to the webinar. <laughs> Hello, Sally. Thank you for no, joining. I don't, think the, I don't think the panelists can hear uh, participants. No. Hey, Sally. Hi, Sally. So if you, if you have questions today, uh, what we can do is please put those questions in the chat and we're going to monitor the chat and take the questions and ask Marshall, Marshall directly. So um, there we won't, I don't think we can do, the, the panelists can't hear the audience. So the best way to get your question to us is through uh, the chat or the Q&A button that you on the bottom of your uh, panel here. Um, okay. And, and we can't see you. No, we can't see you, correct. Sally, a little change in plans from Marshall. We won't be uh, asking the um, questions that um, were sent in previously. 
So I just want to know now. So, great question from Robert. How to go about getting new business in the corona time, okay? That's a great start. That's a great question. Yeah. How to get... And smart to get your question in early. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Ruben, for joining. It's really late. We really appreciate 10 p.m. in Indonesia. Thank you mm -hmm. for joining us at this time. Gally, we can read you in the chat. We just can't see you. We can't see or hear you, yeah. That's the way the program is designed. So we can read you in the chat. Hey, Ray. Got Manila. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, we have Melbourne. Oh, thank you, Lynette, for joining us. 1 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Good question, Vincent. Thank you. You're welcome, Sally. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Natasha. We have San Diego in the house. Oh, it's, we have people from Australia, and it's really, really late. In fact, it's next day. I, we really appreciate you taking that pain and joining us today at this time. Malaysia and Greece are in the house. Oh, wow. Indonesia. Manila. Sacramento. We're getting global. We're very global. New York. Miami. Miami. Dubai. Montreal. Montana. St. Petersburg. Hi, Somu. Thanks for joining. From India is also now up there. Well, I'm oh, I, I, I will from uh, Connecticut. Will is part of the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches, along with um, Cynthia. Wow. Taiwan. Taiwan, India, Florida. Fantastic. I think. I am feeling very international this morning. <laughs> Right, we yeah. get some Q and A's. We're also getting questions in the Q and A box. Um, mm. It would be a great and a better place to put your questions than in the chat because in the chat, I'd hate for them to get lost at the speed that the chat is moving right now. So if you do have a good question, there's a Q and A uh, button down at the very bottom of the, of your screen. Uh, go ahead and put your questions in there, and that's going to make it a little bit easier for us. Uh, who are who are kind of monitoring the questions coming in from Marshall. Uh, that's going to make it a lot easier for us to see them and get to those questions. So I think that's going to be a better, uh, we have over a thousand people registered today. So uh, I don't know that we'll have that many on, but we're going to get a lot of questions. So I think if you put them in the Q&A box, that's going to be probably a lot easier and uh, we'll probably see the questions uh, a lot easier than, than, than in the chat. We have a lot of questions regarding the challenges of getting business during COVID-19. So um, we, we've got that. Great questions. Yeah, Soma, that's a great question. Hey, Mitali. Yep. Do you want to send Marshall his link again? To Kate? I would send it to, directly to Marshall and to Kate. Okay. Let me just. That link that you just pulled up that we just yeah. sent. Yeah. Let me just send this. He may not know to press on the link like I didn't know. Uh, to press on where it says here. Oh, is it? Red, do you have the full link for him then? Or or just maybe let him know to click there. I'll just put there, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a question for you, CB. We'd like to know about Association of Corporate Executive Coaches, how to be part of the association. 
Oh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, um, I can put in the chat. There he is. Good morning. Hi. Alert from calendar. Hi, Moshu. Calendar Valve of G100, visionary leadership. Very good. We have 186 participants online so far. We do, and we have a thousand registered. So we might like, we might have about four or five hundred. Yep. Usually there's a, a gap there. Um, yesterday, I a day before yesterday, I had two thousand seven hundred and forty nine participants. Wow. <laughs> that was at the WBECS. That yeah. was. A, I was there, Marshall, one of them. I was there, Marshall. We watched you. Yeah. Yeah, that was a mob scene. <laughs> that got great feedback. Yeah. Well, we've got. Uh, well, uh, this all was a, Go ahead. Go ahead, Andrew. And Ella was there, too. We Josh Snow no, was on, too. I, I didn't hear you. Josh Snow. In, in the chat, there's all the great. All the people who followed you on the Webex. Yeah, it was nice. Very, very nice. Omran. We've got people from Egypt and Malaysia and the Philippines and all over the world today so far. We've got Zurich and Texas and Connecticut, Japan. Yeah. Paris, France. Who's that? Australia at 1 a.m. So. Saudi Arabia. Good. Percent of the people on this webinar would have been on the previous WBEX webinar. A lot of yeah. Yep. Any idea? A lot of people chiming in right now on the chat that says they were in the session, uh, the WBEX session. Okay, Maybe I'll change my agenda then. That's okay. I'll talk about something different. Yeah, a lot of people weighing in that they were, that, that they were both, they're coming to both. No. Josh, no, hi. All right. Mask is Syria. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, we have a very international group. Very international. Yeah, Mercedes, Madrid, one of our uh, 100 coaches people is Pau Gasol, yep. who is a famous Spanish athlete. Yeah, he's a wonderful, wonderful fellow. Trevor from Cambodia, thanks for being here today. Uh, so we've got a lot of people who were on the WebEx. Um, good. Nice. Shanghai, China. Thanks, Linda, for being with us. Very nice. Jean Paul. Hey, I'm Ron. Good to see you. Hey, man. <laughs> we got Sally. Sally's on today. So is Amran. Sally's on. Yeah. Cynthia is on. Yep. Part of MG100, Marshall. I know. So should we get started about five after you think? Yeah, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. Yes, we'll get started in about two minutes. Let people get a chance. People are still signing in here. This yeah. is about the UN, people yeah. from all over the world. <laughs> hello, hello. Yeah, we have people from all around the world here. Got Dubai, Kuwait, and Italy just joined, Munich. Oh, somebody said something nice. It was nice, but I brought a little sunshine. That's nice. Oh. <laughs> It's the next day in Perth. Thanks for joining, uh, Eva. It's got to be uh, early in the morning there. Ireland is in the house. Spain. Or no, it's Lord. late at night. It's late at night in Perth. It's it's uh, mm -hmm. really late. I am. Hi, Sue. Romania. <clears throat> been to, I've been to most places. I've been to Romania. It's very, I had a great time. Hong Estonia. Kong. Estonia. And Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah. Estonia is a great place. Love Estonia. Australia. Hey. Is it the next day in Australia, I think? It is. Yeah, it is. Late, late. In Sydney. Carter. 
Well, Marshall, you want me to go ahead and get started? Yeah, let's roll. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome to uh, to the to our webinar today. It's my pleasure to start us off today. My name is Rhett Power. Um, we hope everyone is staying safe and healthy in these uncertain times. Uh, that is why Marshall wanted to have this webinar, is to check in with you, uh, our stakeholder-centered coaches, and to answer your questions about coaching and leading in times of crisis. So thank you all for being here today. I want to set the tone today with a quote from uh, Peter Drucker. Uh, he said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I think that's apt for where we are in the world today. Uh, this is, in essence, I think what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about coaching and leading and building your business in the new normal. So there are only, there's only one rule for today. Marshall may add a few. But uh, one rule that we have is that you ask questions, lots of questions. Now, we have a, a lot of people registered for the chat today. We're not going to get to all of them. But if you take the little Q&A, the little Q&A button down on the bottom part of your screen and put your questions in the Q&A, that's gonna be a lot easier for us uh, as we, we, we feed questions to Marshall. Uh, if you put them in the chat, they may get lost because everybody is writing hi from Madrid in the chat and that's moving really fast. And so we may, we may lose your question. So put them in the Q and A uh, box. Uh, one other thing to keep in mind is to let's uh, no politics today. No, we're, we're gonna talk about coaching. So let's, let's uh, leave the politics out of it and let's be kind in the chat and in the questions. So other than that, uh, let's, get, let's get to it. Uh, Marshall, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to SCC coaches, SCC coaches today and uh, from around the world. The floor is yours, sir. Well, let's first, find, we have a very, uh, very diverse and interesting group of coaches. So I'd like to have my four guests basically introduce themselves. These are four people who do a fantastic job of coaching yourselves. And so, I, real quick, tell us a little about you for the people that don't know you. Okay. Was that yeah. me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I am so glad that everybody's here. Marshall, thank you so much for creating such a wonderful space. I am C.B. Bowman, and I am the CEO of the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches. Mm. And you can find out about us online by going to acec-association.org. Basically, we are an association for master level corporate executive coaches. And thank you. Round of applause for the panelists. Okay, Natalie. Hi everyone, I'm Mithali. I'm based in London. I'm a business coach, a certified stakeholder-centered coach, part of MG100 and also a action coach partner here. Uh, I've also been the UK coach of the year for best client results. So really happy to be here and thank you so much. Hey, how about Rhett? Hello everyone, I'm Rhett Power. I am co-founder of Courageous Leadership, which is a brand new uh, leadership, uh, leadership consultancy uh, based in the United States, but we, are, we operate around the world. Uh, I'm an author, I'm a Forbes and Inc. Uh, magazine columnist. And I'm a LinkedIn Live host of Power Lunch Live. So, and I'm MG, and I'm MG100. So, thank you. And a great, and a great guy, and a great guy. And Andrew. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So, I uh, I'm based in Paris. I've been doing this type of work for about 35 years. I started off as a teacher, and then a trainer, a consultant, a business consultant, and now uh, I'm also uh, an SCC certified coach and a member of the 100 Coaches Group, which is fantastic. And we are here to serve you today with your questions for Marshall, and who's so generously given us two hours of his time. And so we're all deeply grateful for that. So thank you, Marshall. Thank you. All right, let us begin. Now I'm going to change what I was going to do, given that I did a work for the W Bex group and there were 2,700 people on that call. So many of you may have been on that call. So I want to not repeat what I've already said. So I want to start with a little content before we go to the Q and A. I always like to give some people a little something new that I'm working on. So 
now I'm working on um, my new book. My new book is called The Earned Life. And the essence of my book begins with uh, an interesting paradox of life. In the past, we had almost no choice. You were brought up in an environment and that's where you lived. You didn't really have a vote. 99% of all of us lived where we were brought up. When I say us, I'm talking about our long ago ancestors. So this applies to the huge majority of all of our ancestors. Most of our ancestors were people who were like peasants. They had no choice. They were brought up in this environment. They, you, men did what their fathers did. Women did what their mothers did. Um, everyone had a reasonably predetermined life with very, very, very little choice. Today, uh, the geography, you didn't have a choice on geography. You lived where you were brought up. You didn't have a choice on your religion or philosophy. You were brought up to believe what you were told to believe. And if you didn't like it, at least you pretended to believe it, because if you didn't like it, you were ostracized. And the, the world was controlled by kings who said they were descended from God, and by religious people who said they talked to God, and then by the military who said, if you have any doubt about what my two brothers said, I'll kill you. So given <laughs> that, everybody kind of went along with the game plan. We didn't have a choice. Now, the bad news is we had no choice. The good news is we had little regret. Why? Because you can't regret a decision you've made when you cannot make a decision. So today in life, we have choice. We have lots of choice. You can live where you want to live, believe what you want to believe. You can get married or not get married, get married over and over again, be a man, be a woman. You got a choice, plenty of choices. Yet with increased choice has come increased regret. Because when we make a choice out of a series of thousands of possible choices, we can make the wrong choice. And again, you can't regret a choice you cannot make. You can regret a choice you can make. So we have increased deaths of despair, drug addiction, alcohol problems, depression. And one reason is we have lots of anxiety in life today because we have so many choices. So the first part of the book is looking at our lives and it's called creating your own life. Creating your own life. We have the opportunity today to in essence create our own lives. And when we do this, we have the opportunity to look at the options available to us and say, who do I want to become? Who is the me that I want to be? I went to a program with Aisha Bursell called uh, D Design the Life You Love and in the program, she asked, who are your heroes? My heroes are very kind and generous people who are really nice teachers. And she said, why don't you be more like them? I thought, well, that's a very good question. I decided to adopt 15 people, teach them all they know for free. And the only price is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. So I made a little selfie video, 30 second, very primitive video, and put it on LinkedIn. I said, I'm Marshall, I got rank top coach and educator, and I'm going to adopt uh, 15 people teach them all I know for free. And the only price is when you get old, you do the same thing. I thought maybe 100 people would apply. I'd adopt 15 young people. I'd be some old man wandering through life. They'd laugh at my jokes and, you know, I'd stumble around. And then they'd get old and adopt 15 more people. And the sort of cycle of life continues. So that was kind of my, uh, my expectation. I, I had no idea over 18,000 people would apply. So now in our program, it's called 100 Coaches, you can look it up. We have, we have 300 members and 18,000 applicants. So you've all had a chance to participate in this process. So Matali, what, is, what would you say this group is like? This is fantastic. This is like, it's like a family at work. And I mean, the best thing is that you can reach out to anyone, anyone in the group, and they, they just open their heart to you. And, it, it is so humbling. And I think it's a DNA that you are driving, Marshall. So thank you so much. We are so grateful to you. And, you know, CB, what's been some of your reaction dealing with the group? Oh, my God, Marshall. It is the most amazing group of people. It's not just the humility and the mind. It is the personality, the decision to work collectively together and to reach out to people that are not in your immediate circle. It gives us the courage and strength to do that, to, to mentor people, 
to bring them in and bring them up the next generation. And you have modeled this so well for us. Thank you. And you know, I would say with our group, we have three rules, no money. So there's no, it's not a business transaction. There's no money involved. There's no guilt. People don't have to do things. And the only expectation is you do nice things for other people. So if, uh, let's see, Rhett does something nice for Macaulay, the expectation is not she has to do something back for Rhett. The expectation is she pays it forward. And down the road, she helps a different person, another person. So the idea is there isn't this, if I give you something, I'm expecting something back. The only expectation is if I give you something, you're gonna do something nice for someone else. And it's been an amazing, amazing process. And, and two of you, CB and Natali, mentioned the term community. So you see, to me, this is an example of what I talked about earlier, creating your own life. This is creating a community of people, creating our own community. And you know, in the past, look right now at this call. We have people on this call from I don't know, 100 countries. And you can have a community now without living in the same town as people you can create your own community. So one suggestion I have for many of the coaches is, you know, are there people out there that you would like to help? And you could say, you know, look, I'm, I'm be honored to just try to help you as best I can. And I, if there's no money for this, it's just, uh, I just think you could help the world be a better place. And there are things you can do to help other people. So it's been a very, very nice idea. And I think it's something we can all implement in our own way. So the first part of my new book is basically, it's called Creating Your Own Life. And part of it is, rather than saying, I live in this community, you can create a community. And the other thing today is, um, people are lonely, They're very lonely. The amount of loneliness in the world is at an all time high. And so I think, you know, being able to be a little creative and say, you know, look, people are lonely, but that doesn't mean your neighbors have to be the only people you talk to. That, you know, that we can have an opportunity to influence people, maybe people from around the world who aren't necessarily our physical neighbors, but people that we can help each other and people we can associate with. So part one of the book is called Creating Your Own Life. And then part of it is about living your own life. Because one of the things in the new world is that it's a danger for all of us is called vicarious living. What is vicarious living? Vicarious living is living our lives through the lives of other people. Uh, unfortunately, 20 years ago or 22 years ago, I wrote an article and I made a prediction. My prediction was within 20 years, media addiction will surpass drug addiction and alcohol addiction combined as a social problem. We're there. Media addiction, our society is a disaster. The average kid in the United States that's flunking out of school spends 55 hours a week on non-academic media, 55 hours a week. It's like a disease, it's like a drug. Um, two of the biggest uh, hits in terms of website, you, YouTube, two of the YouTube stars, one of them is called PewDiePie, the other one World Wrestling. Combined, I think they have something like 120 billion views, billions of hours spent watching a sarcastic Swedish guy who's been accused of being a racist play video games or watching people pretend to fight in world wrestling 120 billion times. Well, again, I can't imagine there's a whole lot of societal benefit from any of this stuff. So the problem also is this is incredibly addictive. People are being paid billions of dollars to create fantastic products that will make you an addict. And they're very good at it. Let's face it, we all love that binge watching those Netflix TV shows and we could spend hours just glued in front of that TV. Mm -hmm. There's only one minor problem. That's not your life. We're living the lives of someone that is not us. Vicarious living, living the lives of someone that's not us. And I think one of the great challenges in life is, number one, creating your own life. And number two, living the life you create. And especially if you have children, measuring how many hours a week they spend on, on media. Another disaster is Facebook. I mean, just a total disaster. You see these fake lives on Facebook where, you know, the vacation, did you ever notice those vacations? The kitties are beautiful and everybody's happy and 
the food tastes good. And nobody's ever been on a vacation like that, really. And normally the kids are little monsters and the food tastes like crap and the hotel screws up and people are rude. That doesn't, you don't see that, right? No, you see these fake lives of these people living this uh, sort of allegedly sanitized, beautiful lives with, you know, and by the way, the pictures have either been photoshopped or taken 1500 times. So you finally get a good one. Well, you know, I have to say, it's very depressing to look at that stuff because when you look at it, you realize my life isn't that good. And it's actually people that spend more hours on that are more depressed for two reasons. One, you either looking at that stuff and saying, you know, my life isn't that good. My life isn't so cool as those people. And you feel sad because you're not as good as they are. Or number two, you are one of those people and you realize that's not me. I'm just making a fake life. And I'm presenting this fake life to the world. And I know deep in my heart, it's not me at all. It's just a pretend life. So I think second big challenge is first creating our own life. Challenge yourself and say, who is the me I want to become? Then the second is, when you do focus on that, live that life. Don't, you're, don't live the Kim Kardashian life or the PewDiePie life or the wrestling life or the character on Netflix life. To the degree you can possibly do this, live your own life. Now, I'm a Buddhist. And in the book, I'm gonna talk about Buddhist philosophy. Most of my books are kind of Buddhist philosophy books anyway. And the good thing about Buddha is I, I called Buddha up and I said, Buddha, I use all your material all the time. Is it okay? Buddha said, it's just fine. It's just fine. And I said, I'll send you some commissions. He said, no, all free, all free. So very good. I'm always uh, using the Buddha material. And, you know, he never charges me commissions for it. One reason I don't charge any of you commissions is Buddha doesn't charge me commissions. So anyway, I'm always using his Buddha stuff, right? A great Buddhist philosophy is every time I take a deep breath, it's a new me. So I want everybody to look up here. Smile. Take a deep breath. I want you to do your hands like this. And I want you to think it is a new me. It is a new me. Everything that happened before. Everybody needs to hit the mute button because I'm getting a, a kick up here. So, Rhett, you guys need to hit the mute button. Somebody's having a. Yeah. Okay. It's a new me. Everything that happened before this second in life was done by an infinite set of people. Their names were called the, the previous me's. So I want everybody to take a deep breath and close your eyes. Think of all those previous yous. Think of all the gifts those people have given to the you that's listening to me right now. Think about how hard they tried. Think about all the nice things those people did for others. Open your eyes. If any group of people did that many nice things for you, what should you say to those nice people? Thank you. Thank you. So do your hands like this. Thank you. Thank you. Now, did a few of those people make a little mistake or two? A little mistake or two? Look up here. Ah, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. I've asked thousands of people around the world this question. When I grow up, when I grow up, I want my, ch when my children grow up, I want my children to be. There's one word from parents. What do you want your children to be? One word no matter what country I'm in, it comes up more than every other word combined. What is that one word, mommy and daddy? I want my children to be happy. Happy. You want your children to be happy? You want your parents to be happy? You want the people who love you to be happy? You go first. You go first. Now, some of those previous yous made a little mistake or two. Ah, who's that first person we need to learn to forgive? Let's forgive this person right here. Let's just forgive that person. Now, I want you to think about your life, that everything that happened before this second wasn't done by you. This was done by the previous yous. It wasn't done by you. 
It was done by the previous yous. Everything you have received from those people is an inheritance. They have given this to you. This is your inheritance. Now let's say um, red. This red I'm talking to you, what has this guy red earned in life? And you know what that answer is? Absolutely nothing. Rhett has earned, the Rhett that's listening to me right now has absolutely learned, he has earned nothing. A CB, nothing. Natali, nothing. Andrew, nothing. Not one thing. You have not earned one thing. Everything you have has been inherited. It's all been inherited from those people. Everything you have, and by the way, everything you have learned came from their mistakes. Everything you have learned came from their mistakes. If they had not made those mistakes, you would not have learned what you have learned now. The pain they experienced that's given you what you are now. The mistakes they've made that's given you what you are now. Thank those people. Now, yesterday I talked to Dr. Jim Kim. If anyone in life should be able to coast on his achievements, it's my friend, Dr. Jim Kim. He's been founder of Partners in Health and president of Dartmouth College, head of the World Bank. He's literally saved 20 million human lives. Literally, the work he's done has saved 20 million lives. You might think he could say, well, you know, I can kind of coast now. Well, those are the previous Jim Kims. What did he say? I've earned nothing. I've earned nothing. Every day I re-earn my legacy of life. So as we journey through life, it's a great way to look at life. Every day I'm re-earning my legacy. Every day I'm re-earning my legacy. And very important to think about the way you talk about the people in your past. If you don't forgive those people and you say bad things about those people, uh, how would you like that uh, Natalie in the future to be saying bad things about the woman listening to me right now? Would you like that? No. If you say bad things about those Matalis in the past, what are you teaching the Matalis in the future to do? You're teaching them to say bad things about you. In many ways, the younger versions of ourselves, they are our parents. The younger you, your parents. The older you, are children. The younger versions of you are your parents. The older versions of you are your children. Those younger people created the you that's here right now. You are creating the older people. And yesterday, Dr. Jim Kim was very moving and said, I want to make mommy and daddy proud. I want to make mommy and daddy proud. So if we look at life, first, creating your own life, and then second, earning the life we create. And we need to look at this as a constant process of reinvention. Some people say, well, do Buddhists believe in reincarnation? My version of Buddhism believes in nothing but reincarnation. Life is constant reincarnation. That's all it is. There is no permanency. There is no marshal who's, the marshal here today is different than the marshal of tomorrow and different than the marshal of yesterday. Life is a constant set of reincarnation. So if we look at life that way, very important to think, how can I earn it? And one of the members of our group is Curtis Martin. Have any of you had the opportunity to listen to Curtis Martin speak? Curtis is a, number five rusher in the history of the National Football League in America. He's on the Hall of Fame. He's just a wonderful man. He's trying to help others. And he's an amazing guy. And so many athletes. I won the Super Bowl. Well, 30 years later, you're talking to a guy in a bar who's talking about winning the Super Bowl. He didn't win the Super Bowl. He was an old man in a bar talking about the past. He's not that young guy that won the Super Bowl. Well, so many ex-CEOs, ex-athletes just fall off a cliff. The numbers for athletes are awful. 
uh, something like 90% divorced, 50% bankrupt in five years. Why? They try to buy love. They try to buy love. People no longer love them because they're stars. So they try to buy love from everyone around them. As the Beatles said, can't buy me love. Well, you know, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. So as we go through life every day, important to take a breath and do two things. One, ask a question. Thank you, previous me's. Thank you, previous me's for the gifts you've given this person. Thank you, thank you. Then you think, what is the gift I wanna to give to the future me's? What is the legacy that I want to live for those people? What is a gift I want to give them? And hopefully so they'll look back and say, thank you as well. Now here's the balance. The balance is between two things, immediate satisfaction and delayed gratification. There's some interesting research called the marshmallow study. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but it's quite famous research and they have little kids. And the child is given a marshmallow and the child has a choice. And the choice is, well, I could either eat the marshmallow now or wait. And if I wait, I get two marshmallows. Well, you know, the research is very clear. I mean, I think they may overstate the research a little bit, but still the point is well made. Kids that wait for the marshmallow tend to be much more successful in life. They're much more achievers. They're, you know, they exhibit delayed gratification. They're people that get highly educated. They save money. Why? Because they believe in delayed gratification. So that's one level. And that's a very good point. By the way, delayed gratification is more associated with success than IQ or almost anything else. Anyone's success in life is able to exhibit delayed gratification. Anybody who has a PhD is good at delayed gratification. Why? It's painful. It's a painful process and you just put off gratification for later. There's one thing they didn't do in the study though. They gave the kid a marshmallow and said, well, if you eat the marshmallow, you don't get another one. If you wait, you get two. What they didn't do in the study is go to the kid with two marshmallows and said, if you wait longer, we'll give you four. If you wait longer, we'll give you six. Well, the problem is, if you wait long enough, you have thousands of marshmallows that you never ate. So this is our balance of life as we move forward. How much do I want to give to the previous rat or Andrew? And how much do I want to eat the marshmallow? Jack Welch uh, died recently, he was former CEO of GE, and my colleague, Mark Ryder, writes books with him. And Jack Welch almost died. And when he almost died, <laughs> He talked to my friend Mark and he, he made one commitment. He said, why am I drinking cheap wine? <laughs> why am I drinking cheap wine? I'm rich. I'm going to die anyway. And he has this wine cellar filled with all these fantastic wines. He's not drinking every night. He's drinking this cheap shit. So he goes, why am I drinking cheap wine? I'm going to die anyway. What's going on here? That was his one commitment, by the way. He'd lived 20 years later, but still, his one commitment upon his heart attack is quit drinking cheap wine. Well, this is the balance that we always have to maintain in life. When we look at our lives, two things. One is, I'm going to enjoy now. And two is, I'm going to invest for the future. So that the, and the ultimate thing, the ultimate winner is if you can do two things at once. One, I enjoy what I'm doing now. And two, I really believe what I'm doing now is going to make a positive contribution to the future, to the future me, to the future life. And if you can do those two things simultaneously, that's the ultimate win. So the final part is, you know, creating our own life and then earning the life we create and such a healthy attitude is every day breathing and saying, I haven't earned one thing. I have not earned one thing. Everything I own has been an inheritance. It's all been given to me by those other people. That wasn't me. I didn't do any of that stuff. That wasn't me. That was given to me. It was all given to me. So what do you say to the previous years? Thank you. 
thank you, previous use. Then you say, all right, what can I do now to make a nice legacy? A nice legacy for those future use, and then maybe ultimately a nice legacy for the other people beside even me. So, now, who has good questions for me? I think CB, you're going to take the first question, aren't you? Yes, I have to unmute first. <laughs> so the first question that came in from the audience, Marshall, is many people have heard you say that during and after the COVID-19, coaches really need to learn how to hustle. Can you give us three concrete examples of hustling? And remember, we're not Marshall. Well, let me talk about what I mean by that. I think very important coaching is a beautiful, a beautiful profession and a very difficult business. Coaching is a wonderful profession and a very difficult business. And many of the coaches that I've met are wonderful professionals, yet not wonderful business people. Many coaches have difficulty in selling, in marketing. The average income from a coach is very, very low. And one of the reasons is that many people have troubles with this. Now, let me ask my four panelists a question. Have any of you ever had the following thought before? My good work should speak for itself. <laughs> my good work should speak for itself. Let's everyone look up here. I want you all to smile and breathe. Uh, do you really think God is going to leap down from the sky and recognize you for your good work? God may have something better to do this week than leap from the heavens and recognize you for your spectacular and wonderful work. So the first learning point is, yeah, uh, I just got a note here from a good friend, Sally Helgeson. Yeah, <laughs> one of the things we talk about in our book, How Women Rise, is expecting others to simultaneously praise you for your fantastic work. That is a myth. That is a myth. You're your own marketing function. If people's good work would speak for itself, all anyone would ever have to do is make good products, and you don't need a marketing department. People would all run out and buy them. Well, in the world of coaching, back to CB's good question, you are the customer. And whether you work for stakeholder coaches or whether you work for any coaching organization, it doesn't really matter. The credibility you get from that organization lasts about 15 minutes. After that, it's up to you. This is a purely individual business. I don't know any business that's more individual than this business. This is not like McKinsey where you hire McKinsey, you're hiring this name and this organization here. When somebody hires a coach, they hire you. You are the client, you are the business. So a couple of suggestions. One is build your own brand. Build your own brand. Now, and you need a brand that's simple enough to be understood. My specific brand, helping successful leaders get even better by achieving positive change in behavior. If you do a Google search, helping successful leaders, in quotes, go ahead and do that, helping successful leaders, in quotes. The first 500 hits you see, 450 are gonna be me. And the entire rest of the world will be 50. Me, 450, rest of world, 50. I won. Well, that wasn't an accident. I set a goal to be the world's authority at that. Well, you can't be the world's authority at everything. So you say, I want to be the world's expert at what? Then you really focus on building a brand. And it's hard work and it's pretty thankless work. I mean, uh, Red, all those power live things you're doing. You can paid a lot for doing all those right there. How much are you getting paid for all that? Well, I think that'd be zero. Yeah, you know, you're not getting paid for that stuff. Anybody getting paid? You guys getting paid for doing this call right now? You getting paid lots of money for this call? No, well, you get paid the same I am, nothing, right? Well, you know, I just did that WBEX call for 2,749 people a couple of days ago. What do I get paid for that? Zero. So you need to really focus on building a brand. And building a brand is often thankless. You don't get paid for it. And it's hard. It is very hard. I mean, you know, I've got 1.3 million followers on LinkedIn. Try that out for you. Go, go, go try it. You know, it's not easy. 
it is not easy. It requires day after day after day after day after day after day of work. So I think it's very important for a couple of things. One, build a brand. Two, recognize this is part of your life and give the same kind of positive attention you give to that as you give to your work. Let me give you an example, authors, even more stark example. Being an author is worse than being a coach from a business point of view. It is a total disaster job. How many books, Amazon has 30 million titles, 30 million. How many books do you have to sell to be in the top half of that 30 million? Write down that number on a piece of paper. Just write down that number on a piece of paper. How many books do you have to sell in the top half to be in the top half of Amazon? How many do you have to sell? Just write down a number. We'll see how close you get. And the answer is two. Two. Yeah, two. 50% of those books sell zero or one copy. In fact, about 10% of the books that are written never get published at all. Now, I'm not so arrogant to believe that the books I've written are better than those books. I have a degree in mathematics. There are 15 million books last year that sold zero to one copy. I'm not so arrogant to believe that every book I've written is better than those books. I'm sure many of those books are better than anything I ever wrote. Statistically, they have to be. And in fact, statistically, not just the 15 million in the bottom half, the 150 million that never got published, I'm sure many of those are spectacularly good books. No one will ever read them. Well, do you really want to write a great book that nobody reads? Well, if you want to be a coach, that's why you need to build a brand. Why are you listening to me right now? Because I have a brand. If I didn't have a brand, you wouldn't be listening to me right now. You wouldn't know who I was. Why would you tune into this thing? Why did 2,700 people listen to me two days ago? Because I have a brand. So very important to focus on. This is a key part of my life and a key part of my job. So thank you. Hey, let's hear it for question number two. Sorry. Uh, I was just looking through the, just got a very interesting question from, uh, from the Q&A. And here, so this is a question from Michael. And he said, are we moving to the new normal or the new next? Uh, that will be followed by a series of new nexts, Marshall. So are we moving to the new normal or the new next? That will be followed by a series of new necks. Yeah, I think life is the new next. So it could be every day we're moving into the new next. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is the world is changing rapidly right now. It's always changing, just a matter of how fast. So I, I, you know, I, I don't think there really is a normal. Um, and one of the people in our 100 Coaches group is named Rob Nail, CEO of Singularity University, and he has a great quote. He said, the pace of change you're experiencing today is the slowest pace of change you will ever experience for the rest of your life. The pace of change you're experiencing today is the slowest pace of change you'll experience for the rest of your life. Things are not gonna slow down. They're only going to move faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. So, you know, I, I think that's it. I think there isn't quite a new normal. This is the pace of changes. And again, I like the idea of reinvention every day. Because what that does is it does away with complacency. Because what you're thinking about is, okay, that was the previous me's. Well, that was the previous me's. I like them. This is now me. Uh, what have I earned? What have I done that's creative? What have I done to make the world better? What have I done anything? I haven't done anything. I'm just coasting here off the previous me's. So I think that's a healthy way to look at that question is when it's a new you, you have everything to brag about. You didn't do anything. Those previous you's did. And by the way, another kind of vicarious living is living through the previous you. That's not you. You're living through someone else's life. That life is gone. That life is gone. So good question. I believe just constantly we're reinventing ourselves. Okay, number three. 
Yeah, Marshall, I have a couple of questions around how the world and the coaching world is particularly changing into the virtual world. And, and uh, like Satya Nadella of Microsoft just said that two years of digital transformation has happened in two months. How do you see the impact of technology on coaching as a profession? Um, it's going to be huge. Right now, I'm experimenting with a very new coaching approach. Some of you have tried this called the LPR. How many of you are doing the LPRs? And we meet weekly and it's all done like this. I've got an experiment now with 50 very distinguished people including the CEO of Cardinal Health, the CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation, the head of the New York Public Library, all these people. And we're doing everything every week virtually. Let me describe how it's working. It's a very fantastic experiment. So what we do is I have 50 really distinguished people. And every week we meet in groups of um, somewhere between five and 10, pretty much every week. And then what happens is we have one hour meetings. Mark Thompson and I are doing this together, and we schedule six sessions every weekend, Saturday, Sunday, six sessions, so people have flexibility, and they're in a different group every week. So every week they get to meet new people, we're doing it for 12 weeks, and every week they get to meet new people, every week they stand up and say, you know, my name is Tony, I wanna to get better at, here's how I'm doing. They ask for feed forward, like in stakeholder culture, they ask for feed forward every week. So in essence, they get 50 coaches. So every week we've been doing this and it's all done virtually. And the people are from all around the world, like this call, like the call I did on WVX. I mean, we have people from all around the world. So I think this is very, very positive for coaching because what you realize is, you know, you don't have to do this. My, my son, by the way, owns music schools. And, um, my, my son has come up with a very creative idea called broadwaylessons.com. So we're gonna get Broadway stars, one of them is in the 100 coach group, and they're gonna give lessons to little kids, music lessons. So instead of your little kid getting a music lesson from the local kid on the corner, they get a music lesson from a Broadway star. Now I am going to do a pilot video on this, of course. Uh, uh, my granddaughter, um, Avery, likes singing. She's five years old and incredibly cute, of course. And uh, her favorite character is Scar from The Lion King, who is my neighbor in New York City. And so I'm going to get this guy dressed up like The Lion King and give music lessons to my little daughter, uh, my, my, my granddaughter Avery, as a pilot. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those stage parents who's pushing their children, their grandchildren to the stage or anything. No, I wouldn't do that. But so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's another cool example of stuff you can do online because you got all this flexibility. You know, you want to get a music lesson from a Broadway star, knock yourself, they don't have any work anyway. They're all unemployed. Just knock yourself out. So I think there's all kinds of creative stuff we can do from coaching because what we're getting rid of is geography. You're not really limited anymore to this little space where you live. You can work with people all around the world. So I do think it's a, it's a kind of a neat idea to, I think this will be very helpful for coaching. Okay, good, next question. Thank you. So Marshall, we had a question from, we had a, a question from Trinity, and, she, and I don't know if Trinity's a man or a woman, I do apologize, but the question is, I'd love to hear. Trinity, she was in the movie, The Matrix, I remember her. Ah, yes. <laughs> she, was, she was something else. Um, Trinity, I'd love to hear your thoughts on conducting remote stakeholder briefing sessions. I have one coming up and, and, and I'm open to great ideas. Well, I mean, I may have ideas. I don't think they'd be great ideas. <laughs> I just did some of those today. And just my only thing that I need to do is take notes because I'm incredibly forgetful. And the only suggestion I have is I think they work just as well on this online stuff as they do in person. The only thing is just remember to take notes because I forget what people have said. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm just old, but I forget what they've said. And so you really do need to take copious notes so that after you do the stakeholder interviews that you can actually remember what they said. And it's very easy to get lost in conversations that are enjoyable and fascinating and forget that you have to remember this stuff. I think it works fine. 
I mean, it's most of what I do is that. Most of what I do is that. And, and I've got this new project I'm working on. And again, I'm not doing any coaching by myself anymore. I'm working with other people. Uh, all the stakeholder interviews are just done like this. They're all done through Zoom calls. And the process. By the way, a lot of problems are problems we create. If you go into something with the attitude of, I'm going to make this work, it'll probably work. And you go into the attitude of, well, this is going to be difficult, it'll be difficult. So just go into it with the attitude of, you know, I think I'm going to make this work. And it probably will. Okay. Hey, Marshall, we have a question from Cindy, who we all know, a powerful question. She says, I've noticed that in these complex times, many of my coaching clients are reevaluating reevaluating their lives, which is expected during uh, yeah. this time. And with that change um, and lots of time, they want to go deep. How do we help them while staying carefully on the coaching side versus the therapist side of the line? Well, again, there's always this definition of what is what, but to me, is what you're focusing on in terms of therapy the future or the past. See, one of the differences to me between what we do in therapy is the focus is the feed forward, it's the future. And therapy is largely the past. The other thing is, I mean, I don't do any therapy at all. And I tell my, my, my clients are very successful, rich people typically. What I tell them is, look, you're, you're, once you pass 40, whining about mommy and daddy's not impressive anyway. So, you know, whatever mommy and daddy did, take a deep breath, you know, let it go let it go. So I'm not in the therapy business. And what I tell people, if you want a therapist, that's great. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Some people can benefit from it. Get a therapist. That's just not what I do. So I would not go down that road because number one, there's not a lot of research that shows they're going to get better because they sit there and complain about mommy and daddy. There's anecdotal evidence that this helps people, but if you look at real research, does anyone change behavior because they sit there and talk for you hour after hour talking about their parents? Not really. There's no research to support that. And then, and, and then number two, so you're not going to get any measurable change in behavior. And, and also mommy and daddy are not the stakeholders. They're not filling out the forms. So mommy and daddy are probably not going to change either. So I would sort of, I don't do that. And the way I avoid doing that is I sit there and say, you know, look, I'm not here to fix mommy and daddy. Why don't we just forgive mommy and daddy? Just take a deep breath. Ah, oh, mommy and daddy. Let go. Whatever they did, let it go. You know, they're gone. And you're not going to change mommy and daddy anyway. So just focus on what can you do now? What can the present you do now? And again, if they do want therapy, that's fine. I just think it's a mistake. Unless you're a qualified therapist, don't do it. That's simple. Don't do it. Just say, I don't do that. Okay, very good question. Next. Sorry. Well, sorry, I had my question ready. This is a great question, and uh, and it was something. Here it goes. So it's, I had it ready, and then I um, I lost it. That's okay. And so the the, I, the idea was to say: Is there is there um, is there, uh, uh, in the Marshall Goldsmith family? Is there a, a, a Marshall uh, one hundred coaches? Uh, 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 possibility for young people who will be able to pay it forward in yeah. the future? It's a very good question because one of the things that we always bring up in a 100 coaches uh, group is the issue of inclusivity versus exclusivity, which is very important. And my goal is that this idea is going to live beyond me. Hmm this idea will live beyond me and that people should make those decisions themselves. So to be part of the larger group, what I think is, you know, everybody can have their own group. I can have the people that I adopted and, you know, CB, you can have the people that you adopted and Natalia, you can have the people that you adopted. And that is much more your decision. And, and, you know, it just happens that I made a strategic choice to adopt the people that I did. And I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just a choice I made, right? Well, people can make their own choices. Now, and so I would say you do want to, though the philosophy of the program is you want to adopt somebody who's going to make a difference down the road. So you might say, well, gee, why are you helping already successful people? Because they have the 
shadow, they can impact thousands of people. And I could adopt somebody, then teach them all I know, but pay it forward, nobody's gonna listen to them. Nobody's gonna listen to them, so they might as well talk to a wall. So I'm not saying this is a good plan, this is just a plan I chose. It's perfectly good to work with poor people and sick people and all that, that's good. I just, it's not this program. So the thing is, is it is what it is. The idea behind the program in my mind is you really try to help people who then can focus on helping others, yet you wanna choose someone who's gonna have the potential to help others in the future. If they have very little potential to help others, it's still a good thing. It's still a good thing. You're not gonna make much impact with it. Impact is much more limited. If they can help a lot of people, and if you have a young person who down the road can help a lot of other people, it's a great idea. And the other thing about all the stuff I'm doing is, last time I checked, nobody's stopping you from doing it. I don't recall sending an email to anyone saying, you know, you really can't do this yourself. You have to wait for me to do something. So I don't think anybody's stopping you from doing whatever you want to do. Yeah, so you feel like doing it, knock yourself out. Okay, next. Marshall, Marshall, it's a, it's an interesting question. Do you miss traveling and do you miss the miles on your platinum guard? Yeah, that is an interesting question. <laughs> you know, um, I don't really actually miss it so much. It's kind of a blessing in disguise for me because it's given me the opportunity to think more and write more. There is there's one person though that during this entire process, I think deserves everyone's thoughts and prayers. So if we can all have a moment for a second and on a serious note, and that is, uh, that's my wife who has to live with me 24 hours a day now. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she is missing it then. <laughs> I don't think I miss traveling that much, but I think she misses my traveling an incredible amount. <laughs> Excellent. And <laughs> Marshall, I mean, there's a question which is just built onto it that what aspects of in person coaching is something which will get missed out by doing virtual and never kind of, you know, meet that gap? Is there anything you think? I, I, I've not found this to be a problem at all. I even today, before this call, I talked to someone I never really met before for an hour and, you know, months. It was that different. And you know what? Let me help everybody. Matali. Are we gonna change what we can't change? Yeah. We are not gonna change what we can't change. So we can sit there and fixate on what am I not doing? Mm -hmm. you know what you're not doing? You're not doing what you're not doing. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Acceptance. Uh, oh, I mean, you know, life is filled with stuff you can do. Yeah. Yeah, don't fixate on, gee, well, I can't do blah, blah, blah. I'm okay, fine, you know. I, as much as I would like, I can't be a Broadway star. Or how about a rock and roll god? Would I have sacrificed my career as a leading executive coach, a mentor to such wise and deep people for the life of a degenerate rock star? Yes, I would have. <laughs> but nobody gave me the choice. Ah, ah, so since can't be a rock star, here I am. You know, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? So why fixate on what you can't do? You can't do it, you can't do it anyway. Brilliant. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank you, Marshall, as always. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, that's hard to top that. <laughs> uh, I have, there's a question from Faz Kamar, uh, which I thought was, was really interesting and, and really pertinent to what many leaders are, are feeling today. He, he asked, many leaders are driven by fear of the uncertainties and the huge responsibilities to their organizations and to their people right now. Uh, how do you reach beyond the point of that fear and help them when, in, in, as a coach? Well, I answered this on the WBEX program, but maybe some of you weren't there, so I'll do it again, especially this person, probably from India, Kumar. Mithali, does that sound like an Indian name to you? Yeah, uh, yeah Kumar. Yeah. So anyway, so let me give you a little uh, a Hindu answer to that question. Okay. Now, the world's most popular poem is called the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita, you have the story of the uh, general and the charioteer. 
Arjuna, and then the, the person is uh, the driving the horses there is really Krishna. So uh, Arjuna is sitting there going, oh, this is bad. You know, I could do this thing over here. It was very bad. But then I may have to do this. It was even worse. And I had these two choices, bad and worse. And he's going on and on about how awful it is. And the Krishna character listens and says, look, it is what it is. It is what it is. Make peace with what is. Now, he didn't say hide from the hard reality or pretend it's not there or sugarcoat it. No, the opposite. Face the hard reality that exists. It is what it is. Then you have two choices, option A and option B. You make a decision. You make peace and you move on. Well, you know, that's what leaders need to do today. I mean... And again, I'm gonna go through my advice for leaders, okay? My apologies if you heard this in the previous group, but this is great advice for leaders because I'm often asked, you know, it's very hard to keep focused. So in today's trying times, you learn in the Gita, don't fixate on the results. You can't change the results. Don't fixate on the past. You can't change the past. All you can do is what's there. All you can do is what you can do now. So I'll talk about this in two dimensions. One, the human dimension, and two, the leadership dimension. On the human dimension, first, all right, this, I'll tell you the story of the golfer and the beer can. The golfer and the beer can. So the golfer is in the country club championship. And he's not that good, but it's a little country club. He has a chance to win. He's all excited. He's on the last hole. The group in front of him is a force of noisy, drinking, very annoying. But he does good. He gets in the last hole, pew, hits a drive. Straight down toward the left side of the fairway, a perfect drive. It looks good. Click, something happens. The ball goes over into the rough. Oh, very upset. What could have happened? He's very, very distraught. He walks toward the ball. He sees a beer can. The ball has hit a beer can that these idiots have left on the fairway. Oh, he's really angry now. Those fools are ruining my day. I hit a perfect drive. It's not fair. He's so angry. He walks to the ball. What do you have to do? Breathe. Forget the beer can. Forget the beer can. Forget the drive. Forget winning the club championship. You come up with a strategy. If you're one shot behind and you want to go for the championship, you say, I'm going to go for the green. Probably won't do it, but I'm going to try. If you're two shots ahead, I'm going to pitch into the fairway and I'll still win. Whatever your strategy is, you come up with your strategy. You breathe. You walk up to the ball. You forget the previous shot. You forget the beer can. You forget the club championship. You focus on only one thing. Hit the shot in front of you. Hit the shot in front of you. All you can ever do is hit the shot in front of you. Well, in today's trying times, there's so much going on. As people, we need to hit the shot in front of us. One of our great hundred coaches is Terry Kramer. Terry was the CEO of Baxter, he's a great author, just a wonderful human. Terry was asked a question. How can you sleep at night? You've had to lay people off, you've had to fire people, you've had to make these hard decisions. These decisions have hurt people's lives. How can you sleep at night? You know what he said? I only asked two questions. Did I do what I thought was right? And did I do my best? The answer is yes and yes. I can sleep at night. I'm not saying I was always right. I did what I thought was right and I didn't always succeed. As long as I did my best, that's all you can do. So in today's trying times, look, you do what you think is right and you do your best and you go to sleep at night. You've got to do that. And when you coach people, and anyone's interested that didn't ask me already, I'll send you, a, this is called the six question coaching process. And it's not you as a coach coaching them, it's teaching them how to coach their direct reports. And what I teach every leader is that you have a regular dialogue with each of your direct reports and cover six questions. Question number one, where are we going? And say, here's where I see us going in this changing time. And then, where do you think we should be going? 
and say, where are you going? Here's where I think you and your part of the business is going. Where do you think you should be going? Then doing well. Here's what I think you're doing well. And then ask a question. What do you think you're doing well? A very good question. What are you proud of? Still them ask question. You learn a lot if you ask people, what are you proud of? Then number four, ideas for the future. And as all of you know, I'm a great proponent of feed forward. Now it's so much focus on the past, I can't change it anyway. Moving forward, here's ideas I might have for you. And then ask the person a question. If you were the advisor or coach for you, what ideas would you have? And one of my coaching clients was George Bors, CEO of Toyota Financial Services. And he said he was amazed at what he learned when he asked that question. If you were the coach for you, what ideas might you have? He said, half the time, your ideas were better than his. He would end up saying, forget my ideas. I like yours better. Question number five, how can I help? And question six, what ideas do you have for me? Six basic questions. If you want to copy this, send me an email, marshall at marshallwilson.com. I'll send you an article about it. And then the key to making this process work is called mutual responsibility. Mutual responsibility, you say, okay, um, direct report Andrew. Direct report Andrew, if you ever feel lost or confused, if you ever feel lost or confused, I, mean, I got a note here from Vincent, said he tried that today and it was like magic. Well, thank you so much, Vincent. Thank you so much. So I would say, you know, direct report Andrew, if you ever feel lost or confused, you're, you feel overcommitted. You don't know what's most important. I want you immediately to talk to me. Because if I do my job and you do your job, there's no reason we should have any ambiguity. We sh there's no reason we should have any confusion here. Now, you also need to say during periods of rapid time, something like this, you know, uh, Ms. Matali, this may change. This may change. Our strategy today may not be our strategy five weeks from today, or five years from today, or five minutes from today. This may all change. On the other hand, at any second in time, I want you to have complete clarity in terms of our priorities and your strategy. In other words, at any second in time, you have a strategy, you walk up to the ball, and you hit the shot. You hit the shot. You block out all that other stuff, all that noise, the beer can, block it all out. Hit the shot. Hit the shot. So that's basically some advice for these. Uh, turbulent times that we lived in today. Just hit the shot. Basketball terminology, one of our hundred coaches is Pau Gasol, a wonderful guy. And in basketball, they have a phrase, next play. And whatever you happen, next play, next play, next play. You've got to forget it. You've got to forget it. The referee made a bad call. It wasn't fair, next play, next play. Mommy and daddy were mean, next play, next play. Um, uh, Red acted like a fool yesterday, next play, next play, next play, next play. Can't change yesterday, next play, next play, next play. Okay. Marshall, thank you. We have two kind of related questions. One question is, during this time, should coaches change their pricing? And the mm. second kind of related question is, as a newly certified SEC coach, how do you get corporate clients? Well, the answer is to the first question, what is the perfect price to charge? That is exactly the highest price they're willing to pay before they say no. That's it. <laughs> the perfect price. That's the highest price they want to pay before they say no. If you go above this price, they say no. If you go below that price, they'll pay it, but you could have made more. So the perfect price is how much they willing to pay before they say no. Now, uh, you know, uh, let's take Matali there. Now, Matali, you have to tell the truth. Matali, have you ever talked about how busy you were before and overcommitted at various points in your life? Have you had that happen? Yes. And I want you to raise your hand and repeat after me. Yes. I, Matali, was stupid. I, Matali, was stupid. Yeah. If I had too many clients, I wasn't charging enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
all right, my clients have something to hear from me now. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, that's, I mean, uh, you, people brag, I'm overcommitted, I have too many clients. What are you bragging about? You're just not charging enough. You, you want to have fewer clients? Charge more money. <laughs> Duh. Yeah, I, I always love it when people brag about being overcommitted. I'm overcommitted, I have too much business. Well, you're not charging enough money. Hey, by the way, I can guarantee you charge enough, you won't have too much business. Yeah. Yeah, you're just not charging enough. Raise the fee. Now, what is the magic fee? Hell, I don't know what it is for different for each person, but you just, you, you experiment, you learn from the market, you experiment again, you learn from the market, and you just do your best. It's, why do I charge what I charge? I make it up. Where do you think these things come from? Out of the sky? How do I know? I just make the crap up as I go. Nobody knows any answers to this stuff. You know, this is, you know, there's not some market out there for coaches determining what you're going to get paid. You just make it up and, you know, it's all supply and demand. It's all just supply and demand. That's Did they it. reduce their um, pricing as a result of COVID-19? If they, here's the point. If you have no money and no business, that's kind of a hint. Maybe you need to do something different. And if you have too much money and too much business, that's a hint. So let me help you. Too much money, too much business, raise the fee. No money, no business, lower the fee. <laughs> you see, I, I have a degree in mathematical economics. You can tell by the profound nature of my answers here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Marshall, the other question, the other part of the question was, how do you get corporate clients as a newly minted SEC coach? You might not. You know, I would just work with other people to the degree you can and have them help you and make referrals and recommendations. And you've got to take one step at a time. I mean, you know, I had an unfortunate meeting at my home many years ago. Three young people getting PhDs came to my home. And now we're at kind of a third level school and they're getting their PhDs. And I always try to be nice to people. So they sit there and this guy looks at me and he says, um, well, you know, when we graduate, we're going to do what you do. We're going to do what you do. They're like the average age, about 30 and one. Hmm. Well, what do you mean you're going to do what I do? They go, oh, we're going to coach CEOs like you do. Now, have any of you been to my home in California? Have you been to my home there? Yeah, yeah. Is it a small home or a big home? Yeah, yeah. I live in this damn mansion, right? These kids are sitting there, we're gonna do what you do. I'm going, well, let's see. And I, I, they're in my library. I got these 40 books there that I've published. You're gonna be me when you graduate. Uh, well, they forgot the 11 million miles. And they forgot the 42 books. Yeah, you, you see the big house here? Most people don't live in houses like this. No, no, no. You're not gonna be me when you graduate. You gotta earn it. You gotta pay dues here. Yeah, you gotta pay your damn dues. You, you put in 11 million, and by the way, I make a little joke about 11 million miles. Anybody flown 11 million miles before? Try it out. It's not so easy. Yeah, spend a few nights on the floor of the airport. Yeah, tell me how glamorous it is. You know, it's not so easy. Well, back to the earned life, you know, you gotta earn it. And the answer is, how do I skip ahead without earning it? Good luck. Good luck. You probably not. You got to pay your dues. You don't pay your dues. Well, you, you, you know, you kind of get what you pay for. And as far as I can see, if there's a shortcut, I managed to miss it. Yeah, I managed to miss that shortcut. So, you know, I, I, from my experience, you got to pay your dues. You pay your dues. Okay, you still might not win, but you pay your dues, you increase your odds. You don't pay your dues, you're probably not going to win. Yeah, and give me some instant shortcut. I, I, I don't know. Nobody gave me an instant shortcut. Yeah, 11 million miles. That doesn't sound like an instant shortcut to me. That sounds like a long cut, very long cut. So, you know, there's no shortcut here. You have to earn it. I mean, how do you get 1.3 million followers, one at a time? Yeah, one at a time. Mother Teresa, how'd you say 50,000 lives? One at a time. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be like Mother Teresa. I want to go out there and save 50,000 lives. Okay. You, you go out to the slum, live there for a while, and you start saving them one at a time and tell me how glamorous it is. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be like Mother Teresa? You pay the, you earn it. You pay the dues she paid. You'd be like her. Till then, maybe not. Maybe not. 
So, you know, it's hard. It's hard. You've got to earn it and you don't earn it by, gee, now I got a coaching certification. Now all of a sudden, you know, the world is going to bow down. It doesn't quite work that way. No, you've got to earn it and it's hard. It's, as I said, coaching is a wonderful profession and a hard business. It's a tough business. I'm in a group called the Learning Network. In our group, we've had about 30 people. Some of you met some of them. And, you know, I think, and these were very distinguished people. Sally was on a call as a member of our group. And uh, nine of them experienced at least some extreme financial difficulty during the period of our group. And these were very distinguished, top of the world people. They published best selling books, and, you know, they still got hammered. You know, it's a hard job. It's a very hard job. And, and you know, like uh, CB and, and Matali, you know uh, two people in our group, Tasha, Urich, and Lainey. Well, Lainey works for Citicorp, and she does a great job, and she has a really good job. And then Tasha's an entrepreneur in her, on her own business. And, you know, last year, Tasha was kind of like doing a whole lot better than Lainey in some ways, and she's kind of a little star and running around giving talks and making a mint. And Lainey was working for Citicorp, doing great work, not quite so famous. Well, that was last year. This year, Lainey's a lot better off than Tasha. You know, Lainey's a lot better off than Tasha this year. Well, they don't call it risk for no reason. They don't call it risk for no reason. And you have a choice in life. Do you want security or do you want risk? And if you want security, you go for security. You get a corporate job, you get paid if you're sick, you get paid if you don't show up, you know, and you have a job and you get a check. You want risk, you take a risk. When you take a risk, you have to face the reality of failure. Uh, Matali, do most small businesses succeed or fail? 70% of the fail in first five years. 70% fail in first five years, that's it. So you, you have an existential decision and we're all adults here. You make a choice. Well, if you're gonna go off on your own, you've made a choice and it's not an easy choice. You've made a choice to take a hard road and you've made a choice that there is a reasonably high probability of failure in any entrepreneurial situation. And I'm sure Matali, you're a good coach, but you can't make them all succeed. You're not that good. None of us are that good. So you do your best, you make a decision. You're an adult though. You have to face the consequences of your choice. And if you choose to be an entrepreneur, you choose to go off on your own, you choose to do an individual business, you face risk. That's real, that's not gonna go away. And there's no class that's gonna make it go away. There's no course that's gonna make it go away. And you can do everything as best you can possibly do and still fail. And by the way, Matali, you've met many small business people that failed, is that correct? Were they all stupid? Did they try hard? Yeah. Yeah. Now what Natalie's thinking is, those are the ones that didn't listen to me. <laughs> okay, next question. Who's next? It's, yeah. So the question uh, was about um, how do you how do you prove uh, ROI on coaching? Oh, well, that's easy. What I do is we measure positive long-term change in behavior. Now, how do I determine ROI? Let's assume that uh, CB, you're the CEO, and Rhett is the future CEO. So I'll describe exactly how I do this. It's not complicated at all. The first thing is I talk to Red and I say, Red, if I do coach you, I only get paid if you get better. And better is not determined by you, it's determined by all the people around you. And, and you are gonna get confidential feedback and you are gonna talk to these people and you're gonna have this follow-up process and your follow-up with me as your coach and you're gonna follow up with your people and you're gonna get measured. And if you achieve positive long-term change in this behavior, I'm gonna get paid and, and if you don't, I won't. So then Red says, okay, and then I interview these people, and then CB and Red agree on who are your key stakeholders. 
So we interview all those stakeholders and then I write a report and say, well, Red, well, here's what you're doing well, here's what you need to do better. Red says, okay, I think that's right. Here's what I'm doing well, here's what I need to do better. Bring in CB. I say, CB, you're the CEO. If Red gets better significantly, this stuff is judged by these people over this time period, is it worth the money? Yes or no? By the way, CB, if the answer is no, I have a simple strategy. Don't hire me. If it's not worth the money, don't hire me. If it's worth the money, you can't lose. Well, it's kind of hard to argue with. You see, I never make the financial case for my clients. Never. They make the financial case for me. I can't prove to them it's worth the money. I'm not an expert in their business. I don't make the case for them. They make the case for me. If they don't want to do it, don't. It's perfectly fine. I don't try to convince anybody to do anything. I learned a very hard lesson as a coach. What is that lesson? My name is Marshall Goldsmith, not Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm not in the savior business here, right? I'm not saving people. And you know, if they want to get better, they're going to work hard to get better. They don't, they're not going to. I don't care, just don't bother me. Thank you for that, uh, Marshall. How did I, somebody wrote a question I just read. Uh, did I always take this approach when I was a kid? Yep, I did. My very first coaching client, there was nothing called coaching. We were doing 360 feedback. And the CEO says to me, well, you know, uh, boy, it'd be worth a fortune to me if this, let me tell you a story of my, how to get into this field, period. Years ago, I met Dr. Paul Hersey. He was an inventor of situational leadership with Ken Blanchard. So I got to meet Paul Hersey and Ken Blanchard when I was a kid. And they're both heroes of mine. So Paul has kind of left to let me follow him around, trying to learn to do what he does. I didn't know what I was doing, just follow him around, right? Trying to, that's some kid, right? Then one day he got double booked. So he says, can you do what I do? I said, I don't know. He says, look, I need help. Can you do this? I said, I don't know. He said, I'll pay you a thousand bucks for a day. A thousand bucks for a day. Well, that was 43 years ago. I was 28 years old. Thousand bucks for a day. I was making fifteen thousand bucks a year. I'm a poor boy from Kentucky. I said a thousand bucks today. Can I do this? Sign me up, coach. So I go to this program for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. They're totally pissed off, totally pissed off because I'm not him. But I got ranked first place of all the speakers. They call Paul back. He said, "Man, this guy's good. Send him again." Paul was going to reduce the fee from his two thousand to my one thousand but they were happy. They didn't ask for any money back. So Paul's not gonna rock that boat. He calls me up, he says, do you mind if you make $1,000 a day and I make $1,000 a day? I said, Paul, I'm making $15,000 a year. You pay me a thousand bucks a day? I don't care if you make 50,000 bucks a day. He says, do you wanna do this again? I used a Kentucky expression. Uh, does a bear shit in the woods? Does the bear shit in the woods? Yes, it does. Yes, I, I'm more than happy to do this again, Paul. Yeah, a thousand bucks a day. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this as many times as you want. You just keep asking. Well, that's how I got into leadership development. And coaching was kind of the same way. Coaching, this guy said, I got this kid working for us, young, smart, dedicated jerk. Is he worth a fortune to me to change this kid? I said, well, hell, I like fortunes. Maybe I could help him. He said, I don't think it would. I maybe. And then I came up with my idea, like, where's the guy for a year? Pay me. You don't get better, don't pay me. It's free. What did he say? Sold. And that's where this pay for results stakeholder coaching came from. Where did it come from? I made it up. How did I determine my fee? I made it up. What is the definition of creativity? You make it up. That is creativity. Now, I'll tell you one other story that inspired me. This is the Dennis Mudd story. When I was a kid, 14 years old, our, we were poor. So the roof was leaking in our house. So Dennis Mudd, dad hires Dennis Mudd to put on a roof. Now he's poor too, because everybody's poor. And Dennis Mudd, a dad recruits me to help Dennis Mudd because he saves some money if I do part of the work. So I'm trying to help Dennis Mudd. And I'm, Poor Dennis Mudd, I'm not that, I've been attitudinally challenged anyway, but anyway, I'm trying to help Dennis Mudd. And he's so dedicated, he kind of gets me inspired to do good. So we make this roof. And then when the roof is all done, Dennis Mudd, who's extremely poor, goes to my father, his name is Bill. And he said, Bill, I want you to inspect that roof. 
He said, if that roof is of high quality, pay me. If that roof is not high quality, it's free. I looked at Dennis Mudd and I thought, this man is poor, but he is not cheap. This man is poor, but he is not cheap. This man has character, his integrity. And I said, when I was 14 years old, I want to be like Dennis Mudd when I grow up. I want to be like Dennis Mudd when I grow up. Now, I have never had as much character as Dennis Mudd. Why? If I don't get paid, my life goes on. He needed the money. Yeah. Well, you might say it's easy for you to say you don't need the money. He needed the money. He did it. So you got to look in the mirror and say, you know, if I don't believe in what I'm doing, whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? Well, Dennis Mudd didn't blame anybody else. So that was kind of my inspiration. It's interesting. I, I wrote an article about that, and a young man sent me an email after the article, and he said, after he quit putting on roofs, Dennis Mudd drove my school bus. And he said he talked to me after school every day, and he became the small business person of the year in the state of Kentucky, and he said, because of Dennis Mudd. So this is not really a money contest here. It's more of a class contest, dignity contest, than a money contest. Okay, good. Next. Wow, this was so powerful, Marshall. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, this is a question from Sherry. He's saying, what markets or aspects of executive coaching are becoming obsolete and which do you think are growing as opportunities? I've lost several major corporate contracts due to COVID and see this continuing. Love to hear your perspectives on the trend. You know, and the answer is it's tough out there. And one of the things that Bill Carey, one of the people in our group taught me is called pragmatic optimism. You have to face the reality that exists. Many companies are getting hammered here, just hammered. I mean, I live in a small town called La Jolla, California, a very affluent place right by the ocean. And I just walk down the street, small business after small business going broke. Restaurant, David Chang is one of our 100 coaches, one of the top restaurant guys in the world. Three of his restaurants who just put in bankruptcy. Look, it's hard. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit about this crisis, but at least for America, I can't speak for the world, people are experiencing something they've never experienced in my lifetime called economic fear. When you experience economic fear, you don't forget it. You don't forget it. If you talk to anyone in the United States who lived through the Great Depression, they never forgot it. Economic fear is very deep. Uh, my wife's father, I remember we gave him a shirt, a new shirt, and we were going to go to dinner the next day. And we said, well, you can wear your nice new shirt. He said, no. He said, my old shirt is still fine. When my, when my father died, we found many of the presents that we'd given him still wrapped up. He was saving them. He never forgot poverty. He never forgot what it felt like. So when people experience economic fear, they quit spending money. How many of you have heard this already in the crisis? People say the following, you know, one good thing about this crisis is I realize I, I don't need all that stuff. Have you heard this before? I, I don't need all that stuff. Well, let me give you, that's some good news. You realize you don't need all that stuff. There's a little bad news though, because you know, all that stuff, that's 70% of our global economy is all that stuff. Yeah, you don't need all that stuff. You're right, you don't. One of my uh, clients, one of the top uh, fashion stores, they're 90% revenue down month over month, yearly, 90% down. Well, you might say people didn't need that $1,000 coat. Somebody had to make that coat. Somebody had to sell that coat in that little store. Somebody owned the little store. Somebody owned the shopping center. They're all getting hammered. They're all getting hammered here. So my feeling is it's going to be tough out there. I wish I could give you some happy talk that this is going to go away in a week or two. I'm not sure it's going to. 
I think this is going to be a long road back. I think it's going to be a long road back. And how do you fix a global economic issue? You don't. You got to do what you can do. You got to take the business you can take. You got to face the reality that's out there. And the reality out there is very hard. The only advantage I have is I'm 71 years old. And this happened at a time in my life when I'm older. You know, my daughter, very fortunate. My daughter Kelly's a professor and she did win the Teacher of the Year Award at the Vanderbilt School of Business. If you haven't heard that several times, I will repeat it again. And last week, she won the Best Researcher Award in the School of Business as well. So not that daddy's proud or anything. I don't know where my daughter gets this fixation on winning awards either. I don't know where that comes from. It must be her mother that gave her that fixation. I have no idea. So anyway, <laughs> my daughter is very fortunate, though. She has something called tenure, which means pretty much almost impossible to get fired. Today, to get tenure as a college professor, good luck, not gonna happen. It doesn't matter how good you are, they're not promoting anybody. When the money stops, the spending stops. And let's face reality, executive coaches are not the number one item you're gonna spend on when you're going broke. You know, you might say they should, but they're not. I can tell you, you get to spend on cutting costs, they're gonna focus on cutting costs, they're gonna focus on selling. They're going to focus on doing something that immediately hits that bottom line, not long-term investment. So I wish I had an easy answer for you. I don't. It is what it is. You can't change what you can't change. You figure out what can I do to make it now? Now, you know, for many of the coaches, especially the ones that are not doing real well, and there's a lot of coaches that are not doing well right now. I got some advice for you. You know, all that business about leading a well-balanced life and make sure you exercise and take care of yourself next year. Save that for next year. And my advice for this year is you go bust your butt because it's hard out there and it's probably going to get harder. This is not the, well, you know, I think I'm too busy. No, you're not. Not this year. You got to do what you got to do. You know, Sometimes you gotta stay in alive, stay in alive, bump, 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 stay in alive. Well, you know, <laughs> this is one of those years when it's time to be staying alive out there. You know, this is not you know, a happy time for everybody. And you gotta face the reality that it exists. It's not easy. And I wish I could make it sound easy. This is the most difficult economic period in the history of my life. And um, it's, it's tough. And, and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. There is no vaccine yet. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen in London. It could all come roaring back next week. You know, CB, where are you? What town? I'm in Colorado. Yeah, you're in Colorado. Same thing. It could all just come back. And, and Rhett, where are you? Brazil. Yeah. Well, yeah. Brazil not doing real good, as I remember here. That's right, right. In Brazil, as you're getting hammered in Brazil. Uh, so anyway, um, it's tough. It's tough out there. So, And we don't know what's going to happen next week or tomorrow. We don't know there's going to be a vaccine. There may or may not be. And so I don't think we've got any assurances here. This is very historically unique. One other thing is don't waste your energy on what you're not going to change. In my book, Triggers, I have one question to always ask before you deal with any topic. What is that question? Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? Am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? If the answer is yes, go for it. If the answer is no, you just take a deep breath and let it go. That's it. You can't change everything. I mean, the as I've grown older, my level of aspiration is going down and down and down, but my impact's going up and up and up. Why I, I quit worrying about what I'm not gonna change. I just focus on what I can change. And you know, Sally says Stephen Covey had a interesting thing. She said our level of concern and our level of control. You may be concerned about it, but you have no control over it. Why are you wasting your energy? 
why are you wasting your energy? Because, you know, put your energy where you're going to make a difference. Peter Drucker said our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove how smart we are, not to prove how right we are. We get so lost in proving how smart we are and right we are, we forget we're not here on earth to prove how smart we are or how right we are. We're here to make a positive difference. So if you just keep that in your mind, that's a very positive, uh, that's a very positive way to save some time and to, to keep a sense of focus. Indeed. And you kind of answered that. Uh, I, I was going to ask you, Marshall, uh, Shruti wanted to ask you about how you ground yourself, which I think you just really kind of stated that, I mean, about focusing on what you can control. And I think that, I don't know if that's how you would answer that, but that's, that was the question that you wanted to ask. How do, you mean how do I ground myself? I don't understand the question. I guess probably what she's talking about and all the chaos and all the, the things that are happening right now, how do you stay calm and grounded? And <laughs> Think about the beer can. Now, I want everybody to raise your right hand. I want you all to repeat after me. Okay, raise your right hand. It's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah, some people are going, well, gee, it's, it's not fair. You know, I did this and this and this, and it's just, it's not fair. Well, you know what? You're right. Decisions aren't made based on logic or rationality or fairness. Decisions are made by decision makers, and it's not fair. Take a deep breath and make peace. It is what it is. You can't deal with the world as you wish it were. Some fantasy about what life is. It is what it is. It is what it is. Okay, next question. Okay, this one comes from Ross, and I, I know what your answer is going to be, but let me, let me read it. Can Marshall answer my earlier question about coaches exhausted with marketing and building brand and whether it's time to get out of coaching? And the answer is, I don't know you or the specifics. I would say, think about it though. It's always good to think about it. Let me give you an analogy in my own coaching. One of the things I'm best known for is telling my clients when it's time to leave. And sometimes it is time to leave. It is time to leave sometimes. And so you've got to really face that choice of, is this a ship that's going no place for me? And it may be. And then it's time to leave. If you look at all the clients, many of you have met some. Alan Mulally was the number two guy at Boeing. Why well, don't leave? He became CEO of Ford. Why well, don't leave? You're CEO of the area of the United States. I'm getting better. Leave. Jim Kim, Dartmouth, leave. World Bank, leave. You know, you bear as you leave. CEO of Best Buy, leave. And 100% of the people I've told to leave have thanked me. 100%. The only two that didn't had very bad experiences. They ended up, unfortunately, leaving under sad circumstances. Well, Sometimes it's time to leave. Sometimes it's time to leave. And you've got to ask yourself that question. Is this going to come back? And by the way, like David Chang's restaurants, he three bankrupt. I mean, he's a great guy. He's a brilliant guy. He's a great chef. He loved his people. Bottom line is, look, you're running a small restaurant in New York City that charges a ton of money and living and dying on tourists. How many tourists are coming to New York City the next nine months? None. You can't do it. The margins are too low. You can't do it. You got to close the door. You got to leave. Well, sometimes the answer is I have to leave. It's okay. See, what you can't necessarily control is the external environment. And sometimes the environment is beyond your control. I mean, there's a ridiculous book called The Secret. Have any of you read this book before? The Secret. Secret. And that's one of the silliest books ever written, and it sold seven million copies. And the essence of the secret is, if I envision it, it will happen. <laughs> if I envision it, it will happen. <laughs> if we envision this damn thing going away, somebody must have envisioned it going away. It hasn't quite happened yet, right? Well, here's the problem with the book, The Secret. They interview all these people, like uh, uh, Mary wanted to be a movie star, and she envisioned it, and it happened. 
and John wanted to be a basketball champion. He envisioned it and it happened. And, 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 and Jim over there wanted to be rich and he envisioned it and it happened. And, 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 and Mary had cancer and she envisioned it went away and it did. And every story in that book is true. Let's assume every story in the book is true. There's one minor problem with the book. It's called the survivor bias. They didn't interview the dead people. They didn't interview the thousand waitresses in Hollywood who all envision being movie stars. They all envision being movie stars. They're all waiting on tables. They didn't interview the basketball team that lost. All they did is interview the winners. And they said the winners did this and they're winners. And therefore they're winners because they did this. No, the winners did this and they're winners. That is true. Thousands of losers did exactly the same thing and they didn't win, but nobody interviewed them. Well, listen, you can't wish this stuff away. You can't wish COVID away. You can't wish this economic challenge away. And let me help you with one other thing that's the problem with that thinking. It makes people feel guilty and ashamed over stuff that they have no control over. Sometimes you lose. And you don't lose because you're bad or stupid or didn't try. Shit happens. Sometimes you just lose. And you got to make peace with the fact I got to just get up and start over again. It happens. I mean, Natalie and small business, how many hundreds of times have you seen this? People lose, 70% lose. And they're not idiots or bad people. They just didn't happen to work out this year. They lose. Somebody came up with a better product across the street and charged less money. Goodbye, you're gone. You lose. That's it. You're a coach. You kind of were not making a ton. Now they have this and the business goes away. It happens. By the way, if I were 28 when this happened, I would have lost. I'm 72, I didn't lose. I'm 28, I would have lost. My daughter wouldn't have gotten tenure. My son would have not been successful. A lot of life is just timing and luck. And you might have been on the wrong part of this curve, and if that happens, you lose. And sometimes, yeah, the answer is I, I can't be a coach anymore. I'm not, I can't make a living at this. It's just hopeless. It's okay. Everybody doesn't win. Everybody doesn't win. And the other thing is don't blame yourself. Because, you know, you, as back to the Gita, you do not have 100% control over the end results of this stuff. You do not have 100% control over the end results of this stuff. And don't feel bad or blame yourself. You didn't cause this crisis. You didn't cause this. You can't wish this stuff away or have happy thoughts or make it all go away. That's just nonsense. You know, you got to start over and say, all right, what am I going to do now? And maybe what I'm going to do now is I'm going to plow through this no matter what it takes and do my best to make it. Maybe what you're going to do right now is say, this is just not going to work right now. I could go do something else. That's okay too. That's okay too. You just make your choice and live with it. Okay, very good question, CD. Next. Uh, Andrew, I can't hear you. Yep, because, right. So, uh, one question that's just come up was should I, in, in the context, use. Uh, Use the no 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 improvement no fee uh, system, and uh, and you know should we should we should we continue doing that in this time of crisis? Your call. You got to do what you think is right for you. Yeah. That's your call, and maybe you decide. Look, this is just a risk I can't take right now. Okay, it's your choice. My job is not to tell you how to live your life. My job is to help you live the life that you think is a good life for you. And that's your decision. You know, should you do it? I don't know. You might say, you know, I normally would like to do this, but this year I just can't. It's just too much of a risk for me. Okay, that's fine. No. Um, Thank you, Marshall. Yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, Marshall, Hugh Blaine seems to have read your mind and he's asking you the exact same question that if you were to start over today as a coach, what would your new you do differently? Nothing. The reason I wouldn't change anything is 
not because I did everything right. Not at all. I've made many, many mistakes. I wouldn't change any of them. Why? Well, when we change our mistakes, we change what we learn. So you cannot learn from a mistake if you never made the mistake. Now, I've made many, many mistakes. It's okay. I couldn't have learned from those mistakes if I did not make them. And so what do I say to all those previous marshals? Thank you, previous marshals. Thank you, thank you. Given where I started from and where I am, what are the odds it would be better if I changed something? What are the odds it would be worse? It's highly probable. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going, it's okay. Whatever those previous marshals did, oh, that's fine, that's fine. And what would I do if I went back and could talk to them again? I wouldn't talk to them at all. I wouldn't have that discussion. Let it ride. Let it ride. They were fine. Thank you, previous marshals. Thank you. Did they make some mistakes? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Just let it ride. Let it ride. Yeah, yeah. Past is over. Love that. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We'd like to. We'd like to avoid the mistake yet keep the learning from the mistake. It doesn't work that way. This is a good saying. You can't be old and wise without being young and stupid. Amen to that. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I am very proven one thing. You can still be old and stupid, too. <laughs> you have permission to be, don't you? <laughs> you know what? I, I, to be, now, the bad news for me is I haven't earned anything. All those awards and stuff, I didn't earn any of those awards. That's all the previous marshals. That's the tough news, the hard news. I didn't earn a thing. But the good news is all those mistakes that those previous marshals made, uh, wasn't me. <laughs> wasn't me. <laughs> I didn't do that stuff. I was a previous marshal that did all those bad things. Uh, that's not me. I, I, I didn't do that. I, I don't get credit for all the good stuff, but how about that bad stuff? Ah, I knew that stuff. That's those previous me's. Now let's forgive those fellows. Let's forgive those previous me's. Now let's talk about, let's see, Matali. We'll talk to you again. Matali there. The previous Matali's make a little mistake or two there in your journey through life. One or two mistakes? Maybe half of it. <laughs> Lots of them, of course. How about you, CB? Make a little mistake or two? Absolutely no, no mistakes. <laughs> And I have a bridge to sell you. <laughs> <laughs> How about you there, Rhett? You make a little mistake or two as your journey through life. One, two, one, two, three, four. Yes, you. <laughs> even yesterday. Make one or two even yesterday. Oh, I can probably, I, I don't have enough hands to count the mistakes. Yeah, Andrew, How about you, Andrew? Make a mistake or two around down there, Andrew. A little error. Uh, yeah, one or two. You know, I'm 60 years old, so I might make one or two. Uh, we all made those mistakes as we journeyed through life, you know, let it go, let it go, let it go. Don't, don't carry it around. You know, one of my favorite stories is uh, the two monks are walking by the stream. Mm. The woman and she has on a beautiful silk dress and the woman is crying. So one monk comes over, he goes, why are you crying? She says, well, I have on this beautiful silk dress my mother made, yet I must you know, I must cross the stream to go to the wedding. And if I do that, I'm going to ruin my beautiful dress. I just don't know what to do. And one monk says, well, we can't help you. We can't even touch women against the rules. The other monk says, out of heck with the rules. Picks her up on her shoulder, carries her across the stream and drops her off the other side. And, oh, she's so happy. Thank you, good monk. Thank you, thank you. The monk is happy. They walk back. The other monk is angry. You're a bad monk, a bad monk, a bad, bad, bad monk. I'm not bad, but we're not supposed to even touch women you're carrying across the stream. Bad monk, what do you have to say for yourself? What monk says, shit happens. They walk back to the home of monks, all the way back. Bad monk, bad monk, bad monk. So the wet monk dries off and goes to sleep. The other monk wakes him up. You're a bad monk. Why am I bad? Because you carried that woman. The sleepy monk says, well, what woman? What's that woman? That woman you carried across the stream. The sleepy monk says, oh, her? I only carried her across the stream. You carried her all the way back to the monastery. 
Yeah, a lot of us are carrying a lot of shit around, you know. Think about any, can you think of one person who makes you feel bad, guilty, angry, or crazy? My panelists here, raise your hand. Can you think of one person who makes you feel bad? Yeah, you all can think of just one there, that's good. Yeah, I have a question. How much sleep is that person losing over you tonight? Oh, that looks like a zero, a zero, a zero, and a zero. Well, I got another question. Who's being punished here? Who's doing the punishing? You don't have to like that person, respect that person, or agree with that person. Let it go. Now don't let them make you miserable. Forgive that person for being who they are. You got to forgive that person. And Marshall, we have about 10 minutes left, and there's a fun question that came in, which was, what books are on your current read list? You know, what's the last book I just read? Large. What? Oh, one book I just read is called Atomic Habits. I like that book, Atomic Habits. And another book I read, this was not one I'd recommend if you're not from the United States, it's called Hillbilly Elegy. I'm from Kentucky, so I greatly enjoyed the book. It's called, the guy was from a very poor part of Kentucky, even more poor than where I'm from. And he went to Yale Law School. And he talks about his journey. It's called The Hillbilly Elegy, and it's a really good book about the culture and what it was like and all. I, for me, it was good because I was, it was a very big seller, but I was brought up in Kentucky, so I could, I could relate to the book. Okay. Uh, so we had one more quick question. We had one more question about SCC coaches, coaching that I wanted to ask you that we've gotten a couple, in kind of a couple different ways, a couple different versions of the same question. And that is how do you use the Marshall Goldsmith brand to in, in your promotion and in your marketing as an SEC coach? Good question. Now, back to my good teacher, Paul Hersey, my mentor. So I did this program for him and I was very successful. So Paul, then he said to me, oh, well, I want you to work with me and talk to clients. I said, yeah, but Paul, I have no credibility. I mean, I've never done anything before. Who in the heck am I, right? Paul said something very deep. He said, use the word we. I said, use the word we. And yeah, you haven't done much, but we have done a lot. Well, we was 99% him and 1% me, if that. But it was still we. Well, yeah, this is, we have a good we here. It's a very nice we. There's a lot of the we people have done a lot of great work here. So just be part of we. I love I love that. That makes that makes a lot of sense. I love it. Hey Marshall, another fun question. If you had not been a coach, what would you have been and why? Well, I thought about professional athlete, but somehow that just I had no hand-to-eye coordination, I, uh, that failed. So I was not good at athlete. The rock star option, no, that one never quite made it either. How about Broadway star? I might've enjoyed that one, eh, not so much. So, you know, yeah, there's a lot of it. I like most of those high glamor jobs, you know, I would think I would have enjoyed those, you know, but, uh, but uh, that was not quite in the cards for me. So you got to do what you can do here. And I just feel very fortunate because whatever skills I have are well adapted to what I do. Whatever skills I have are very well adapted to what I do, which is, you know, let, let me give you an example. It's kind of a blessing in a way a curse too. So I'll talk about the curse part of it. Okay. And some person says, thank you for this talk. It's 3 a.m. on Saturday. I'm going to bed. You know what? <clears throat> You stayed up till three in the morning. God bless you. So thank you so much for joining us. It is go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> so anyway, I forgot the question. What was your question? Oh yeah, blessing and curse. That's what I was talking about. So so I see I like what I do, but the problem is I like what I do too much. So sometimes I'm flying on an airplane and I go on an eight-hour flight. And some poor person sits next to me. Some poor man goes, what do you do for a living? I start hopping up and down, talking about what I do and coaching this poor person. Eight hours later, you know, <laughs> person's ready to kill themselves. Well, you know, great is the need of the student to learn. Far greater is the need of the teacher to teach. 
So I love what I do. The problem is sometimes I love it just a little too much. Now, let's see, Red and CB and Natalie and Andrew. Have you ever tried to give coaching to people that really didn't have much interest in being coached? Perhaps friends and family members who you wanted to help with your ever so positive and lovely interventions into their lives. And that you're only doing it, by the way, you're only doing it because you want to benefit them. It has nothing at all to do with you and your need to do this shit. No, it's all about them. And you're, you're helping them because you're just a saint-like and godly, wonderful human being. Something along those lines. I look into all of the guilty faces, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, did, did you notice sometimes even those ungrateful shits, they didn't really even appreciate the fine contribution we were trying to make to their lives. And awful, awful people that they are. Just terrible, terrible. It's, uh, we have, it's a burden we have to bear sometimes. So, you know. <laughs> Ah, let go, let go, let go, let go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, another point on that one is I got some comments about that, and that is if people don't care, don't waste your time. I mean, if you need the money, you need the money, and they're, they're probably not going to get better. By the way, if they don't care and you do need the money and you have to coach them anyway, it's not immoral, illegal, or unethical. You give it your best shot and they don't get better. You know what? Uh, yeah make peace, make peace. You know, you can only, you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, on, on the other hand, what I would say is that if you, if you really do want them to get better, they have to care. And what I've learned in my job is I can't make anyone change. I can't make them change what they don't wanna change. You know, people can only change what they do wanna change. And you know, I, I tell people, I'm not here to make you be what you don't wanna be. If you don't wanna be something you're not going to anyway, I'm just here to help you be what you do want to be, and, and certainly that's hard enough. So why don't we do that? Yeah, that's hard enough. Now let's wrap up. I'm going to finish with my favorite coaching advice in the world. My favorite coaching advice is always the same. Take a deep breath. Imagine that you're 95 years old and you're getting ready to die, and you're on this deathbed. Here comes your last breath. But you're given a beautiful gift, the ability to go back in time and talk with the person that's listening to me right now. What advice would that wise old person who knows what really mattered in life and what didn't, what was important and what wasn't have for the youth that's listening to me? Well, whatever you're thinking now, do that. That's the only performance appraisal in your life that's ever going to matter. That old person says you did the right thing, you did the right thing. The old person says you made a mistake, you made a mistake. You don't have to impress anybody else. When my friends interviewed old people, three themes come up. Number one, be happy now. Don't get so focused on what you can't change. You can't change. Be happy now. Number two is friends and family. And don't get so wrapped up in your career. People love you. And number three, if you have a dream, go for it. Because if you don't when you're 35, you won't when you're 85. And business advice isn't much different. Have fun. Life is short. Help people. And that's a real blessing for anyone in this profession. We have the blessing of being able to help people. And finally, go for it. We owe people we don't regret the risk we took and fail. We, we regret the risk we failed to take. So finally, it's always my honor to talk to the coaches here because my feeling is you're all out there trying to help people. And if I help you even a little, you can help a lot of other people and pay that forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall, very, very, very much from all of us. I know that we have thank you, Marshall. very, very much. Thank you for your insight, thoughts and wisdom. Uh, and don't forget, guys, to reach out to any of us via LinkedIn and continue the conversation. I, I know we'd love to continue this conversation uh, after this event today. And, and again, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And is this going to be archived? In fact, it will be, yes. And, and we may even, we've gotten so many requests today to replay it. We may try to replay it on Sunday evening. Um, okay. We'll send out an email about that to the list because uh, we had a lot of people overseas that couldn't make it tonight, I'm sure. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marsh. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. God bless.
What a family. <laughs>